everybody. Um, I'm Martin Downs, um, as uh, Angie has uh, introduced me. Um, I work in the Centre for Applied Health Economics, and um, I'm going to try my best to give you an intro to health economics. Um, it's a large topic. We've only got a, a 45 minutes or so, um, and I'd like to kind of, I guess, you know, make sure we've got time for questions and answers because I think that's often um, the best way to, for people to, to understand what's going on. Um, I guess, first of all, if I can get this going. There we go. Uh, obviously, I'd like to acknowledge uh, acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who are the traditional custodians of this land, uh, the Yagura and Dubro people. And um, we pay our respects to elders, past and present, and extend their respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so I guess what is health economics? And often people think health economics is just about the money. Um, it's all about the money, but there's actually quite a bit more to it. Um, and I just kind of guess we, we, we probably will be getting to the money in this one, but I think I just want to give you an idea of um, what a lot of people in economics and health economics do um, do learn and have, uh, I guess, expertise and, and, and experience in. So overall, health economics is, um, is the study of choices uh, regarding how healthcare is produced. Um, it's about allocation and funding, and it's also about maximizing social way, uh, welfare in the presence of in and funding in the presence of market failure. So um, there's a number of areas that, that are kind of key to this value in health. So I guess how do we assign a value to health itself? Um, looking at the determinants of health, um, besides healthcare, you know, what other factors influence health, health outcomes? Um, we also look at uh, you know supply and demand because it's an interesting market. It's not your traditional supply and demand and demand market. So it's a good interesting idea of what affects the supply and demand for healthcare. Um, Provider and patient behavior. So we, we do we do quite a uh, an amount of work in I guess what we call um, behavioral economics, but it's uh, it's really about choice. Um, it's really about decision making. Um, how do healthcare providers provide dif providers behavior differ from those seeking care? Also, how do patient behavior um, uh, patient behaviors uh, differ, and what kind of choices do people make when they're when they're looking for their healthcare? Um, the other thing I guess is uh, thinking about alternative approach, approaches for health economics and or for uh, healthcare. Um, what in you know what in innovative support approaches can improve healthcare production and delivery, um, and of course planning and budgeting um, is kind of one of the the, the key areas I suppose um, along with value and health, which uh, which we'll be looking at today. Um, so sorry, apologies for the red. Griffith University really loves its red, so a lot of the slides do have a lot of red on it. Um, but I guess some of the questions that we ask in the kind of space of health economics and uh, in, in kind of that policy area as well is, you know, our choices are uncertain, um, the, the, especially in healthcare, the scarcity and, and imperfect markets. So I guess the, the interesting things that we try and come to terms is what combination of healthcare and non-healthcare goods should be produced in the economy which particular types of healthcare should we be producing um, and how to get the best improvement in health outcomes for basically our additional money spent, um, what kind of investment, uh, what kind of like, outcome should we get for that? Um, so, you know, that's about resources, what are inputs, money, people, um, should be used to reduce these healthcare services and um, who should be paid uh, and receive what? So, you know, who's paying it, um, who's receiving money for it? Um, so, I guess a key area for evaluation and what we will be talking about today is um, the kind of uh, priority setting. So we really need to have an idea of what the priorities are for the people who are involved. So uh, we have to know our context. So, you know, for, for you when you're trying to develop a, a grant or even looking at what kind of intervention or uh, a policy you're, you're looking to propose, you have to know your contacts. Who are your decision makers? Are we looking at state or federal government, hospital board or ma managers? Is it just for, you know, EMF grant? Um, so those are kind of things that you're looking for. So oftentimes what we see is we, we get this kind of decision maker ad hoc priority setting because there's so many people playing in the market. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of uh, this, you know, mishmash of uh, interesting things going on um, that we're looking to improve. Uh, and also that, you know, we have barriers against like, you know, budget impact and, um, you know, do we have enough money in economic growth? What's the burden of disease? Is it getting more small and um, so I guess you think like things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes is growing and um, whereas our infectious disease communicable diseases are probably uh, contracting somewhat. Um, so we, we look at all these kind of 
that we can use to basically apply to this kind of ad hoc priority setting. The decision maker puts it all together and comes up with the decision. So that's why it's really important for us to have a, a good idea about who our decision makers are. What are we doing this, this research or this evaluation for um, so that we can inform them uh, moving on? Um, there are more structured decision making, but we won't really talk about that because it's not used a lot in this space, though there has been some movement towards this multi-criteria decision analysis. It's really about putting structure on this, this ad hoc uh, system. So evaluation, why do we do it? What are the first principles of it? Um, it it's, it, I guess, a bridge between the world of research and the world of decision making. So, um, and it's not, when I say the world of research, that includes basically doing something new to find out. It's not necessarily, you know, a person in a university who's trying to develop uh, develop something or do, do some uh, academic research. So it's not necessarily just academic research. I'm talking about, you know, market research and all that other um, areas of development that we do uh, in every day. Um, and I guess the key thing that we have to, to bear in mind here, and it goes back to that kind of priority setting, decision makers have to face trade-offs. Um, and especially, you know, in the current growth, we've got resources that are limited. Um, so we've got finite time, fin finite number of people, um, a finite space for which those people to work. And of course, you know, finite number of dollars. Um, we have basically unlimited uses, combinations of these resources uh, that we can do um, because there are so many things that we can do now because, you know, Research is expanding, people are getting older, there's much more demand for healthcare, and of course, uh, many new things that we can do. Um, so how do we choose uh, what we what we how do we choose what we choose essentially? Um, so you know, things like increasing prevention, or do we increase treatments, do we build new hospitals, more beds, more staff? Um, and then of course, especially kind of on the, the kind of grander state and, and, and uh, federal government level, we got, you know, do we make decisions about more schools because education can improve health? you know, better roads, reduce accidents, those kind of things can all have an impact on uh, on health, but they all build into this, this mishmash, mishmash of resources that are limited. Um, but of course, healthcare is an economic good, so a scarce, scarce relative, relative to our wants for it. So we've got a scarce goods, but we really want it and it's an economic good. So a lot of people uh, have a focus on improving health. Um, so in our space, I guess a lot of what's happening uh, with, with what you would be doing is looking at evaluation of, of new technologies. Um, we use evaluation of the term health technology assessment depending on, on what process we're doing, what we're looking at. But again, essentially, it's, a, it's an approach to, ra to rational decision making. So how do we um, do uh, look at new interventions and new technologies that we can put in place and rationally uh, provide decision making? Um, it's also part of the quadruple aim. You know, we've got, got to reducing costs, improving health and patient experience and the care team themselves. So all of this kind of evaluation, we have to bear that in mind when we're doing the evaluation to make sure that we, you know, produce something um, that's, that's, that's worth doing. Um, so when we say health technology, um, basically we, we talk about anything that, that can be used to improve health. Um, and that includes medical services, pharmaceuticals, uh, even hospital process and, and population interventions. So it's a very wide, broad um, term for basically any kind of uh, intervention that we put in place. So I guess uh, one of those things we talked about is evidence-based medicine. And um, while this isn't uh, necessarily economic evaluation, it's a big major part of what we do for um, for that building of economic evaluation and, and understanding um, health economics. So you know, obviously there are many different sources. Ideally, we look at things like systematic review or trial data um, based on the, the info that came in uh, from Angie of all the people that, that put forward their ideas. Um, we're looking at a lot of kind of trials, um, you know, putting things in place. So um, we try and get things like direct evidence. So randomized control trials, pre post course studies that are really interesting um, and uh, provide good evidence for the effectiveness um, and hopefully the cost effectiveness for uh, these new interventions and these new ideas. Um, there are processes of using linked evidence approaches. So basically that is we've got some 
evidence about um, about an effectiveness of a of a intervention, um, and we, we know how that might have uh, some effect on clinical outcome, but we don't know what the overall clinical outcome is. So we can kind of put a few things together to really understand um, the kind of bigger picture of what an intervention can do. So I guess. Um, if we think about uh, diagnostics are a real good uh, good one to, to look at because you know if we do a diagnostic test that's better than another test we know that we can identify new patients and treat them earlier and get them better now they may not, we may not actually have good evidence that that diagnostic test causes a improvement in health but we can show that by uh, from through other studies that uh, linking evidence together that that diagnostic test means that these patients get treated earlier. We know that these when these patients get treated earlier, they have better health outcomes. So that's what I mean by a linked evidence approach. It's just linking different uh, research projects together to to basically get a better understanding of the clinical effectiveness of, of a, a new approach. Um, so and I guess things that we need to, to bear in mind, of course, is measurements of effectiveness is pretty, pretty Pretty important. We want to know that something does uh, does things better if we're going to use it or even if it's just the same. Um, uh, in diagnostics, we look at performance and clinical validity. Um, clinical utility basically is what do people do with the information that they're provided, and that can be quite important when we're doing that linked evidence approach because we need to know well, does the diagnostic lead to management change, and does that then in turn uh, lead to to improved outcomes? And of course, one of the things that we really have to also bear in mind is you know that extended assessment of comparative harms because sometimes we do things that do cause harm, and we want to understand whether that um, is 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 okay. So um, just looking at uh, economic evaluations um, as a whole, so we, we want to look at, you know, basically budget impact is often important, especially in, in HHS uh, field. So budget impact is just looking at the use and costs of um, new technologies um, and the changes in uh, and use and costs of other medical services that are, you know, around that space. And what we want to do is, is, is work out what are the financial implications of uh, putting something new in, in place. Um, and that's very straightforward. But I guess the thing about that is, you know, maybe we have to spend a lot of money, but is that good value for money? And that's, uh, I guess, where the real economic evaluation comes in. So is the intervention really effective? And if so, is it reasonable value for the money per unit of health gain? So if we get a gain in health, what are we paying for that? So there are, there are no. apologies, I seem to skip back a few. Um, so there are many types of um, economic evaluations and we look at this a bit more, but this is kind of a, a good table to to give you a, a brief overview of what they are. So the, the, the four main types we would use is cost minimization, cost effectiveness, uh, cost utility and cost benefit analysis and this, it's it's all driven I guess by the outcomes and what we compare it with so do we have a comparison um, and do we have good outcomes um, I'll just uh, go on to those so the first one really um, it's kind of the most straightforward as such and that's what we call a cost minimization analysis and that basically looks at the, what we call the least costly alternative but generally speaking what happens is we've got two very similar uh, approaches or interventions or therapies um, that are virtually identical and I guess if we put them in play do we just charge the same amount of money for them or do they just cost the same amount of money so um, that might be you know something that we would be looking at if you maybe it, it might cause maybe some ease in the processes within a hospital um, but it doesn't actually save us any money and it doesn't cost us money so that's a good approach to look at at something like that. Cost benefit analysis um, this is uh, usually something we do where we can monetize the outcome. So basically what we're doing is looking at comparing the, uh, the, the benefits, so the financial benefits um, of uh, this of a new intervention and the costs associated with that. So if those financial benefits outweigh those financial costs, uh, then we have uh, an, 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 a, a, a zero um, cost. Um, and basically we're, we're really just uh, looking at a, a, a if sorry we're looking at if we put something in place is there good value for doing it so we might actually get uh, an improvement in value so we might actually reduce our costs uh, but again we may have uh, additional costs so that that will affect the ratio of our cost benefit analysis um we do sometimes see that with uh, 
uh, HHSs because they're interested in their, uh, the Treasury is interested in how much money is going to cost them. Um, so we often see a request for cost benefit analysis rather than, um, I guess, uh, this next one, which is uh, cost effectiveness analysis. And we, we see cost effectiveness analysis as one of the kind of important um, tools in, in our in our economic box because um, often new things cost more money. So we have to really understand what we're getting back for that uh, for that money, um, and that's where um, where cost effectiveness analysis. The there are two I guess approaches. Um, one is a we look at the bare um, effectiveness outcome, so something like uh, response to cancer treatment. Um, you know, responses are is our is our effectiveness, and we basically look at the cost for those uh, for a a new response to to treatment. I'll give you some examples in a minute. Um, so. With cost effectiveness, we, we need to determine the most efficient investment. So um, the the efficacy is determined at the margin. So we want to know how much more um, of an effect do we get based on uh, the input that we put in. So we're interested in uh, the incremental benefit uh, and the incremental cost. Um, so it's kind of like a cost benefit analysis, just a little bit um, fancier, I guess. Um, the and, and we put that into what we call an incremental cost effectiveness ratios or the ICER. Um, so as I say, it's the the uh, difference in cost, the time one where minus time, time two minus time one, time zero, um, and the, the benefit. So what's the, the additional benefit um, of the of the comparator, not time, but the comparator, sorry. Um, and this can be expressed as a dollar per unit of benefit. So essentially um, looking at, uh, as I say, response, we might have uh, $100 per, um, per cancer response. Uh, what we tend to talk about in, in the health technology assessment world, especially, is cost utility analysis. And this is a really kind of our gold standards. Um, and I will discuss this a little bit more, um, though not a lot of people will be using it. But basically, it's it's the effectiveness in this situation is utility, which is a quality adjusted life year. So it's a measure of quality adjusted life year. Um, so that's basically when our benefit or our effectiveness is measured by uh, quality adjusted life year. So I guess one of the things is how do we choose? We got all of these different um, ideas uh, of what we can do, but is there a way of of choosing um, based on on certain criteria? So often what we do is we we look at how effective something is, um, and generally speaking, if it's uh, superior and more costly, we will do a cost effectiveness analysis. Um, there obviously is uh, to think about the comparative safety as well. Um, so this is a nice little handy table that if you've got, you know, inferior safety but superior um, uh, effectiveness, we'd want to be looking at what we call a cost utility analysis because utility is very important in, in this space. Because if we only look at effectiveness, we're going to get a benefit um, without actually um, bearing in mind the, the, I guess, the safety issues. So that's why that quality adjusted life here is really important in that setting. Um, uncertainty, it, it, you know, we look at that kind of uh, cost effectiveness analysis or cost utility analysis. Um, but, you know, as you can see, we're all kind of heading towards the cost effectiveness analysis or the cost utility analysis, uh, unless we've got really non-inferior, um, uh, so basically no difference between the, the, the two interventions. So that's kind of one of the reasons how we, how we, we choose. I mean, you know, if we've got an inferior effectiveness and inferior safety, we probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, so that's kind of why we've got a lot of uh, these, uh, you know, got health foregone, so we probably need to think about other things. Um, so just to give you an example of how these uh, differ, there we go. Um, so we can kind of, if, if there was only cost in play, and this isn't quite true, but if there's only cost in play, we'd be looking at a cost benefit analysis. We'd be dividing the cost of the intervention over the, the cost of the um, usual care, and we'll be getting uh, a less than a less than one cost, which suggests that it's not, it's not beneficial um, as far as cost is concerned. But what we can see here is that we've got an incremental cost. So our new intervention is dearer than our usual care. So we've actually got an incremental cost. So that means we're going to be spending more money on this intervention. So in this case, it's a cancer drug. So we look at the effects of cancer recurrence. So um, the new intervention has actually reduced the cancer recurrence. Sorry, I'm actually sorry down here. Um, sorry, the new intervention has reduced the cancer recurrence uh, by five cancers avoided. So now our increment is five cancers avoided. So if we just do 
as I say, a simple cost effectiveness analysis, we can say that uh, the cost of avoiding a cancer, a cancer recurrence is $27,000. Um, and this may be uh, true for a number of things in, in decision making, especially in a kind of a hospital setting. We might be thinking about, I guess, the cost for maybe uh, readmission or the uh, cost for uh, uh, for uh, you know more ED visits. Those kind of things uh, would be quite interesting to uh, to somebody in 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 a hospital setting. Um, Qualities, as I say, so the this is, so a utility measure. So this is a cost utility analysis, and the quality is a quality adjusted flight year, but I will talk about briefly later on. Um, what we've done is we've applied the utility of having of not having cancer uh, in this model, and basically what we're saying is that we get an improvement of uh, utility of 4.3 uh, versus 2.1, and that means we're getting that incremental benefit of 2.21 qualities. So our actual gain, because it's, it's less than five cancers applied, our actual gain per quality is different to our gain um, over uh, cancer avoided. So essentially what we're looking at is um, $62,000 or $62,000 per quality gained. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, look, as, as this is where we've actually applied the quality um, and given it a cost. So if we give quality a value, so this is kind of the cost benefit analysis, um, where we can actually cost the outcomes. Um, so what we're saying is that a outcome of one quality, uh, one quality just like here is worth about $50,000. Um, and what we can see here is that our increment now um, is actually 110,000. Um, so we've got a 28,000 net monetary benefit. Deficit rather, sorry. OK, so um, to try and interpret that, we have a thing called the cost effectiveness plane, uh, plane and uh, basically it's a visual representation um, of different scenarios. So if we look at the. What we call so it's, you know, we look at uh, north, south, east, west. Um, so as I say, if we look at the southeast quadrant. Remember, I learned my, my southeast. Um, we look at the southeast quadrant here. So what we have is a new treatment that's less costly, but more effective. So generally what we do, if we had something like that, we'd be like, well, that's really good. Let's fund that. Um, however, what normally happens a lot of the times is we actually end up with our qualities or with our uh, our uh, results in this pane, so the, the northeast pane. Um, and basically what we're looking at here, so this is our ICER. We're not saying what our actual um, inter or effectiveness is, but the ICER here is $132.18. Um, so basically our incremental cost so is going to cost us $132 to get uh, one unit of change, okay, which is all very interesting. But what we're saying is that, you know, we're going to get benefit from this new intervention um, and it's going to cost us this much for that benefit. Now, that doesn't mean an awful lot, I guess. Um, so we have, I'm going to add an extra kind of uh, concept here, and that's what we call willingness to pay. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, so willingness to pay is basically an estimate of what a consumer um, of healthcare might be prepared to pay for the health benefit. And this consumer can be anybody. It can be you as a, as a personal consumer. It can be a government agency or it could be a hospital board. So it's basically what that consumer of healthcare might be prepared to pay for the health benefit. Um, and as I say, it differs by who's paying and for what outcome. So a lot of national health systems use the quality and it can be referenced to the GDP. So a willingness to pay can be referenced to the GDP. Um, some countries have a set willingness to pay. So the UK use uh, 20,000 pounds to 30,000 pounds per quality adjusted life year. Australia is not set, um, but often thought to be around about $50,000. People who have looked at decisions made, especially uh, around the PBAC and, and uh, sorry, the PBS and Medicare uh, interventions, um, the decisions seem to be around about the $50,000. Um, anything over that gets, gets a lot of scrutiny uh, before it's actually uh, listed. Um, so what about uh, HHSs and hospitals? So how do they make decisions um, uh, using a willingness to pay threshold? Well, it's, it's very little known um, and it's not set. So it depends on uh, the processes, what they're doing um, and what they're interested in. So when we put willingness to pay into our 
uh, pain, uh, or pain, sorry, or um, effectiveness pain. Um, we basically say we've decided, decided that we're willing to pay at this level. Uh, so it gives us a nice line. I think that I can't remember exactly what the value of that was. Um, <coughs> I think it might have been 300 dollars um, so that gives us a willingness to pay it at that level so anything below that line means that we're willing to pay that money for it so if we have uh, a much more expensive treatment would actually gives us quite a bit of benefit then we're actually willing to pay uh, more money for it um, and that depends as I say often on the effectiveness so say the the uh, item of effectiveness isn't that good a measure of health we might decide actually we don't want to spend that much money on that uh, uh, effectiveness. So we reduce the willingness to pay. And that means now that our intervention, we're not willing to pay for that intervention. So we might actually decide not to fund that intervention. Okay, so that's kind of giving you an idea around decision making, and what we use the different types of um, economic evaluations for. What I'm going to do is try and move into um, basically how we uh, build these things up and how we, we measure um, costs and outcomes. So what we have to do when we're measuring costs, is we have to decide on a perspective. So are we looking at the whole health system? Are we looking at the healthcare payer? Um, or are we looking at society? So if we're looking at the hospital, for example, maybe we're just looking at what the hospital is doing, then we're only going to really take into account the costs to the hospital. Um, if we're looking at the healthcare system as a whole, which is usually what we do, especially in um, in, in academic research um, and for, for federal government, because the federal government is obviously interested in the whole of the country and how it affects all the country uh, health system. So then we'd use, I guess, thinking about hospital care um, and primary care and trying to uh, gather the costs for all of those um, areas. Um, and if we want to expand it to societal costs, we might actually take into account the cost to the person who's been treated, and if we want to, the broader costs to their, their care family. So that would include, um, I guess, things like time off work, um, maybe education um, and uh, care, the cost of care at, in, in the home. So those are kind of the things that, that we have to decide on our perspective. So for a lot of what we're, we'll be doing um, for EMF, it would usually be based either on the health system or on uh, the services that you're in, that you're working in. So like hospital services or hospital health, health services. Um, so there are a number of different ways of doing it. So there's three stages of costing. Uh, one is identification. So what are the life likely resources um, that will be affected? So are we just looking at an intervention like um, say an IV catheter or maybe a new drug? Um, so maybe the only costs associated uh, with the new drug is actually the cost of the drug itself. Um, um, but we might need to think about other things. So I guess if, to say, we're, we're looking at a drug that now needs IV as opposed to a drug that's given as a tablet, then we might have to take into account those other costs. So it's about identifying what costs are going to happen in their new model of care um, that we're, we're looking at. Uh, and then, of course, measuring and measuring those costs. How do we measure those costs? Um, are there simple ways of doing it? Um, do we need to do micro costing or can we look at, I guess, the broader broader costing systems that are made um, that are available and valuation um, of the resources that are affected? So um, there are a number of things uh, that we need to think about. So sometimes the, it's about uh, valuation of um, materials, um, equipment, um, space, all of those kind of things have to take take into account. And as well, time period. So if we're looking at something that's fairly straightforward, um, you know, it's a trauma happens in ED, they're done and dusted within um, three months, then the time period probably uh, won't have an effect on how we do our, our estimates. But uh, if it's a longer term, so things like CVD, um, or diabetes, we might want to think about how inflation and time affects uh, those interventions and what happens to those people afterwards. Uh, so there are two kind of general uh, approaches that we would use um, in this setting. Um, so micro costing, basically that's detailed resource utilization and unit cost data to, to really generate precise estimates of the economic costs. So the we want to measure the health intervention with great accuracy. And this might be important if there's going to be very little, you know, very 
small things that will, as, as an individual thing, won't make a whole lot of difference. So say it's um, uh, something like IV catheter um, replacement. So an IV catheter doesn't cost an awful lot, but say we're, you know, we're going to get, it's part of a bigger picture and maybe one might only cost a small amount of money, but when we look at it over a long, lot of longer period of time, it might, might actually end up building up to more money. So when we want real accuracy, that's what we're talking about micro costing, really picking up what are the resources that we're using, what equipment are we using, how much time is spent on the intervention, um, and, uh, you know, cost of medication. So really getting down to the nitty gritty of what's being done in in that patient, uh, in that patient space. Um, so it, it depends on what we're doing, but that, that's one of the, the methods for getting costs. Um, the other one, I guess, is is macro costing, and sometimes this is generally a little bit easier, um, but not always possible. So we're really trying to identify and measure composite products or services, really trying to get an estimate of an average of a cost of procedure. Um, so we might have, you know, you might have a, uh, a center that does 100 procedures, and we know how much it costs to run the center, so we know that each procedure is the cost to run the center minus divided by 100. So those kind of things are fairly straightforward. Um, or the other one is, I guess, using um, hospital data. And hospital data is is quite tricky um, because it's definitely done kind of on that aggregate basis. Um, so it doesn't give us that level of accuracy or detail. But if we're looking at kind of a bigger picture, then hospital data is not a bad place to start. So we get hospital administrative data or even going to, uh, you know, something like the National Cost, uh, cost Centre to get their data to really get an estimate of a cost per episode. So um, that cost per episode is determined not necessarily by that episode, but by certain factors within that episode that are done on an average, on an aggregate. Um, and that 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 can be quite helpful. The other approach then is actually thinking about, you know, we can look at uh, national data um, and there are some things where like, you know, emergency, dependence, uh, emergency department attendance has kind of an average for the whole country. Impatient day rates has an average for the whole country. And it's to, all we're doing is collecting that uh, data from the patient and then applying kind of an aggregate cost that we know from somewhere else. So th those are, are other ways of doing it. So the next thing then, I guess, is the measure of, of benefits. So we got got all our cost data. Uh, we have to measure the benefits as well. Um, so we can look at, I guess, natural units or clinical endpoints. So if we're doing a trial, you know, what's the clinical outcome? outcome? outcome. Um, so from evidence-based medicine, systematic reviews, extra ease, um, and, you know, randomized control trials. So I guess in a lot of this space, people will be doing a, a trial. Um, it may not be randomized, but we'll be doing a trial or a cohort study. Um, so getting that kind of clinical outcome from that space is pretty good. Um, and I guess it depends, again, as I say, what, what are we looking at? So life years is a, is a nice one because you can look at the polar a dollar value per life you're gained, though a lot of what will be conducted for EMF grants wouldn't really incorporate life years. Um, strokes avoided is another one, so that's a cost per stroke avoided. Uh, response rates such as, um, I guess, uh, as I said, cancer response um, or, you know, things like ED avoiding, avoidance. Um, these are all things that, that are clinical endpoints that we could look at. Well, ED avoidance is more of an administrative endpoint, sorry. Um, but, they're, you know, they're clinical endpoints that we can look at and we can actually cost our intervention against those clinical endpoints. And then there's a pre preference based me measures. So things like uh, qualities, which are, you know, the quality of life, which is um, what I guess the kind of federal government like to make decisions on or is quality of life. Um, so we're looking at that kind of dollars per quality gain um, and then monetary value. So if we can actually put a value. So as I say, ED attendance is kind of a good one because we can put a value to ED attendance um, and then we can look at a, a monetary value rather than a, a clinical value. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about qualities because qualities are, are an interesting one um, that are used on a national basis. Um, sorry, I'm going to put time on. Sorry, okay, I'm doing that. Um, so the when we are, especially in that kind of decision making space and that priority settings, qualities is a is an interesting one to try and set priority because what it does is it's a method to compare health benefits of interventions for illnesses that. Uh, have prolonged survival versus quality and can be in different um, 
in different diseases. So how do we measure essentially if we're looking at cancer, you know, our effectiveness data is is response. So we're looking for um, a response. We can cost per response, whereas arthritis tra treatment, we might be looking at pain um, reduction in pain. So we can cost per reduction in pain. Um, but how do we mar up a response rate in cancer with a pain rate in treatments? And that's where qualities come in, is trying to, uh, I guess, live, level the playing field to, regardless of what the um, disease setting is. So, and that's what we call it, quality, we call them quality adjusted life here. So it combines the survival with the quality of life. Um, so we need to measure the quality of life of patients in different settings. Um, and we call this measurement a utility instrument. Um, and basically um, we look at, um, there, are, there are a number of ways of doing it, but often what we do, especially when we're modeling, modeling interventions, we look at it in health states. So, so in cancer treatment, that would be the health state of having a response um, versus progressed, for example. So they might have a different utility value um, because they don't feel as well after um, progressing as they would do if they have got a complete response. So we can just assign um, a quality to those patients um, over a longer period of time. Yeah. So the so the index of the utility base basically is is zero is dead, and one is full health. So it's a, it's a well, it's a less than zero to one. Um, scale, so you can actually have a health state worse than dead, um, but it's a uh, it, it's 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 uh, anchored on zero and one, as in being dead as versus full health. So as I say, we look at what the health state is. Um, so that health state, as I say, might be complete response or partial response, or it might be you know no pain or full pain, um, depending on what you know. What population you look at and then we want to value of that health state so how important is that health state and that's where that utility score comes in so we've got the health and quality of life you've got the health state that we want and then we value that health state based on the utility score uh, from patients in that health state and that gives us our uh, quality when we add the time so to give you an idea so this is basically our quality over time. So this is an arthritis patient who's getting worse over time. So you can see that they're reducing. So their qualities over time would actually be getting lower over time, okay? It's a little bit different when we look at a cancer patient. So the cancer patient might have pretty good quality of life. Um, they get diagnosed with cancer, end up with chemotherapy, um, and they might die. So, ooh. So that's where we're trying to get our comparison. So our qualities here versus our qualities here um, are pretty similar, actually, when we look at them overall. So that's trying to gain, you know, what are the benefits of that quality of life depending on the different uh, patient population. Okay. So what a, hopefully a lot of what we'll be doing in your space would be an economic validation in a long side trial setting. So the idea would be that you're conducting some form of trial um, and you'd conduct the economic evaluation while you're doing that trial. And this is um, this is good because it maximizes. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so. Um, it, um, it. Its aim is to compare the additional cost of the new treatment with the existing alternative. Um, and because you're running the two of them at the same time, we can actually estimate those costs at the same time. And also we're recording the additional health benefits. So as we were saying all along, we're looking at uh, measuring those costs and those outcomes, and then we cal calculate the cost effectiveness um, across those costs and outcomes. And depending on what our outcome is, so and this is, as I say, where our priority setting comes in place, are we looking at maybe federal government funding or are we looking at something the hospital is interested in? Our incremental cost effectiveness ratio can be driven by, by that. So basically, what is our effectiveness outcome? Do we need to measure, measure qualities when we're doing your trial or do we need to measure something else? So, you know, the alongside randomized control trial maxes, maximizes the available information for analysis um, because we can do it at the same time. We know what we're collecting and uh, we know what, how it's happening um, and we can really include those considerations during the design stage um, to make sure that we maximize uh, the, the available information. Um, and we, we commonly use them. Uh, for economic evaluations um, because it's it's very handy in the cost effectiveness space, space 
if we can do it alongside trial, it's a lot easier and more straightforward um, than having to do more complex modeling. So that gives you kind of an idea of uh, what you might get up to. Um, so I guess one of the things I was thinking about was um, maybe when you engage a health economist, what would you like to know? What, what, what are the things that you might want to do? Um, I would suggest get in early and try and get in, in contact with a, a health economist early. early. Um, the, uh, often we, we, we will have expertise in trial design um, and also alternative approaches. So essentially, if you don't have if randomized control trial isn't possible, we will have we will have done it all. <laughs> um, we have, you know, numerous experiences in trying to estimate cost and effectiveness in different trial settings and different uh, implementation settings uh, because a lot of us work with government. Um, sometimes everything's done before they come and ask us what the cost effectiveness is. So we have a fair idea of how to look at the kind of uh, available data that's there. Um, we have often we have um, you know, experience in statistics, data collection, and of course, economic uh, evaluations. So, you know, it's, it's important to, I think, um, get in early so we can actually provide some input around that as well. Um, some some health economics, as we went back to the start, I'm saying, health, you know, economics is not all about evaluation, it's not all about money. Um, but, you know, some, some people do work um, in that experience in provider and patient behavior, um, and also kind of alternative uh, approaches to implementation, thinking about people's choices and what, what what works well. So depending on what you're doing, it might be interested to get a health economist's perspective, um, as it might be a different perspective from uh, from yours. Um, we will always want an RCT. <laughs> um, I think that is something that uh, nearly every health economist will. Let's do an RCT. Um, obviously, that's not always possible, but just to be aware, you know, if you, if you think it's not possible and your health economist is pushing for an RCT, maybe push back a little bit. Um, the, the complexity of the evaluation will drive the cost of the work. So um, obviously, that's one of the reasons why we want an RCT because they're relatively straightforward. The analysis is pretty straightforward. We can do things like regression analysis if needed, um, and it makes it a lot more, uh, as I say, straightforward for for doing the economic evaluation. Um, outside that, it increases complexity, and that of course will drive the cost of the work as well. Um, the you know a good health economist will let you know what can be done. So given what your restrictions are, what data availability you have. Um, uh, we will be able to give you options. So you might uh, think of, um, you know, the, there might be a po possibility of doing a costing study. Um, so you might be thinking along the lines of pilots. So can we cost data? So can we look at what we're about to do and actually put costs on those? Um, because that then can be very interested and useful if you want to go forward for, uh, I guess, a more complex randomized control trial, um, because we can then prove that actually we can collect the cost of this. Um, and, and this is how we've done it. Um, the other things that to, to bear in mind is sometimes costing studies, so not just economic evaluation, which we focused on today, um, is that sometimes we can look at the cost of uh, maybe a disease or a process um, that might be of interest to uh, somebody in the universe or in your um, in your hospital. Um, so you know you're thinking that we do does this process we do. Um, it seems like it's clumsy. You, you know there's a lot of processes involved in it. Um, we can just cost it, um, and then we can say, hey, look, this costs quite a bit of money. Is there an, a, a different thing that we can do, a different approach that we can make? Um, or the other thing is, you know, maybe looking at presentations. Um, is there a particular presentation that we get? We can cost that. And that might actually say, well, actually, this, this presentation costs us a lot of money. Is there something we can do to reduce that presentation or to improve the flow of that patient through the system? Um, and, uh, you know, then that can actually drive, I guess, decisions to invest. Um, as well. So those are kind of interesting things that we can do that are beyond the evaluation space. Um, the, uh, you know, especially if you're looking at a health economist from a university, uh, we will often be interested in the research space. So as I say, cost utility analysis is our gold standard, um, but also you know, we should know how to deal with your specific circumstances because a cost utility analysis may not be um, it, may, it may be doable, but it may not be beneficial to what you're trying to do. Um, so you may not have, and especially in that kind of short term acute setting, 
um, cost utility is actually really difficult to show, show an improvement because you know the patients are in and out fairly quickly um, and their utility doesn't change an awful lot. So while you know your health economist might want to do utility analysis, you might have to think about the fact that actually it's not going to make a difference when it comes to the decision maker because your decision maker is really important in this space um, because you, you want to do something and you want to make changes, you want to improve people's lives um, you have to be able to show that improvement to your decision maker um, in order to, uh, I guess, get change. And of course, then change across the, the broader system um, if, if, the, if the intervention you're interested in is working. Um, and that's, that's, that's it for me, actually. That brings me to the last slide. Thank Hopefully you very much, Matthew. <laughs> that's right. Thank you for the excellent presentation and deep dive into economic evaluations in 45 minutes. Mm. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, I really love the last um, two or three slides as well because they are really practical advice and practical tips for people um, getting want to getting into that space, especially on, in the MF space, um, as we tend to have smaller grants. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to either raise your hand or pop into the chat. Otherwise, I might just start with a few questions, actually, because yeah. um, because I do have quite a broad overview of all the um, various projects that EMF funds. And I guess one or well, two important questions for our grant applicants and the recipients is, of course, first of all, the costs, right? Because the maximum amount of funding that we give out also yeah. for the same for any other funding agency is limited. So um, if you need to put a a sum aside for health economics that would take funding away from you know research assistant time or whatever else you need to do. Um, how should people um, consider that question best? Um, how much money do you actually need to put aside? As you say, the more complex the evaluation, the more cost, um, the higher the cost will be. So how how can they aim for a balance to get something done but not take away too much? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, and there's, I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I can try. <laughs> I think probably it, it depends a lot. Um, if you've got a team that's really good at doing data analysis um, and you're doing a trial, so that, that team will be able to do analysis of within that trial. Um, and, you know, a lot of that kind of alongside trial analysis is is uh, statistical rather than you know the kind of traditional health, health economic modeling when people think about it. Um, and for that, that you know, if you can get a, an engaged um, health economist, um, they can probably provide advice and processes, and that wouldn't necessarily cost an awful lot of money. Um, obviously, talk to the health economist is you know depends on who the health economist is um, and what the level of work is going to be involved. Um, if you want more active involvement. Um, you know, you're probably uh, looking at around the fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. I would say, um, but it depends on what what you really want from from what you're doing. Um, I I would suggest Angie that probably modeling isn't going to be covered in a in a, a EMF grant uh, because modeling actually, you know, you're you're looking at probably sixty, seventy thousand to do a proper modeling where you you know you can take the effectiveness of the trial and do that linked approach where we're going to gain kind of uh, information about qualities and um, that kind of knock on what what your effect actually means for the quality of life of a person. Um, then you know that actually runs up quite a, quite a quite a bit more. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to put a figure on until you know what you're doing, uh, but that's kind of where I think, you know, you probably get advice where somebody actually is really pretty savvy with their statistics. Um, you can get, you know, really good advice for probably not, not an awful lot of money. Um, if you want more input, you're probably looking at the, you know, 10 to 20,000. And then if you want a model, um, you're looking at probably, uh, you know, 60, 70,000 mm -hmm. dollars. Thanks. Um, any other questions for Martin? I'm going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> then, so then I have another question as well. Okay. So um, looking at um, what you said about micro costing and macro costing. So yep. I guess another question to balance things out is how many assumptions do I put in there versus <laughs> what's the actual measurement, right? Because I was talking yep. to another grant recipient the other day and they have a data set of 2000 patients or so. So yep. they can either go into each patient's um, audit charts and work out exactly how much things cost, 
Yep. Or you could just do a an assumption and it's a, a rough estimate of um of macro costing, I guess. How do how should people go about deciding what best to do? Because obviously um micro costing will require more resources for economic yes. evaluations. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think I, I, you know it it's it depends a lot on who your market is um, and who you're you're interested in informing. Um, you know, micro costing can be very interesting if there's a, a, you know specific resources that you use a lot of, um, or you know if you're looking at reducing the time people spend with patients, um, be that because the patient lives quicker or or what it is. Um, so I mean that that is. So one of those ways, I guess, if you're thinking of reducing time that somebody spends with a patient, looking at the time a patient is in the hospital is is a, a proxy. So we can make assumptions around, I guess, proxies. So you might want mm -hmm. to think of those kind of things. And, uh, you know, if a patient's in the hospital less, then, you know, the assumption is that people will spend less time with them. Um, so that's one, of, uh, I guess, one of the ways of doing it. And I think it depends on who, who your audience is. So if mm -hmm. your audience is... Um, is the board, I guess, from the hospital. They probably don't really care about the, the nitty gritty. They want to get an overall estimate mm -hmm. of what, what kind of savings you're going to, you're going to give them. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you'll often hear this argument, especially in hospitals, is that we never save any money. Um, it's just more that we shift resources around and we can get people done. So it's it, it could also be about, well, actually, if we do this, this is the savings we made, but that savings actually means that we see X amount more patients, um, you know, or we pass them through to the next level a lot quicker. Um, so I think it depends really on what you're, what you're looking to get out from it. Uh, Microcosting is great if you can do it. Um, I'm very much aware that it's not that easy to do, and um, I don't, I don't use a lot of it. Mostly, I would use probably hospital data, um, so what the hospital actually collects, and that's fine, especially when you're using. If you've got lots of, um, if you've got, if you've got that was a thousand you said? Thousand yeah, patients? two thousand. If you've got so, a thousand yeah. patients, you probably have enough that the aggregate is going to be enough to to kind of you know get that difference to come out. If you've only got a small number of patients, it makes it a lot more trickier, mm -hmm. and that might be where you might think that microcost will be much more important. But saying that a small amount of number of patients is going to mean less resources when you're doing that microcosting. So I think it you know the, it depends on the circumstances. If you've got a large volume of patients. Um, access to a lot of data, then I think you're probably okay to do the kind of more macro analysis. But if you're only looking at a few patients and you're really trying to get to the nitty gritty, then that's, you know, you really want to be thinking microcosting. Mm 